So this whole week we've been talking about Sora, OpenAI's new mind-blowing video generation model, but there's been tons of other insane AI news happening behind the scenes. But first, let's start with this. Elon Musk jumps on Twitter slash X in a live spaces conversation. And here Elon Musk explains the intersection of AGI and potentially seeing if it might help us figure out if we do indeed live in a simulation or not. And he does it all while I think one of his kids is trying to climb on top of his head. So I'm wondering if we could propose another Turing test, a different definition of AGI, which would be actually coming up with new laws of physics or new complete paradigms of physics rather than just, you know, physics is a base layer of reality. I mean, you always quote that, right? Well, I think you certainly uh, have, AI yeah, would think it's, a, would not realize it's in a simulation, which may be the case for us right now. And that would have a, you know, a true physics engine and thus experience sensations in the same way. The simulation hypothesis does explain some elements of quantum mechanics, such as you know, only collapsing the probability distribution when you look at something. Like, why would something be only true when you look at it? Well, if it's rendering in real time, then that's actually how a video game works. Like, let's say you're in World of Warcraft or something, and you walk through a forest, and a rat appears. But before that, was there a rat or not a rat? There was only a probability of a rat, and the rat only became real when you when you looked in that direction. That collapsed the probability space, and the rat appeared. So, so I think version theory actually explains a lot of things that seem quite mysterious, the, sort of the Schrodinger's cat situation. The universe may seem infinite to us, but frankly, if I was creating a simulation of this reality, I would, you know, I would put the stars far enough away that we do not have to simulate the, the details of the planets. And in fact, that is the situation. So you really just have to simulate with high fidelity what is observed on our planet. A much easier task than trying to simulate world reality. And I was joking that, you know, when the James Webb telescope went up that Maybe the reason for the delays was that the, the simulators needed to bring more computers online because now that we could see further, they needed to improve the fidelity of their simulation. So th like their equivalent of Amazon Web Services or something. There was this interesting back and forth between Elon Musk and Neil deGrasse Tyson. That's this guy right here. So he's talking about idea that Elon Musk presented. I saw it once at some forum when somebody asked him a question that the idea is basically this. So imagine that there's something called the base reality. This is the original physical universe. And eventually it gets enough scientific progress and computers and ability to do calculations to create their very own simulation of their own universe or something similar. So they create it and this thing evolves until eventually it evolves far enough to create its own simulation of its own universe and down it goes, you know, forever. So, so now that world evolves and they develop computing power. Right. And they say, we want to play video games. So now we're going to make a world. So then they make a world and then they make a world all the way on down. Right. It could be hundreds, thousands, billions, infinite. Elon Musk's question was, what was the chance that we are living in this base reality. I mean, if you can imagine this thing stretching down forever, as Neil deGrasse Tyson explained it, basically the chances would be something, you know, one in a million, one in a trillion, one in some astronomically large number, that we are indeed in the base reality. Okay, so there's one in a zillion, you're the real universe, and 999 zillion to one that That's you are a simulation. simulation. Uh, that convinced me. And that was Elon Musk's point, that the chance of us living in a non-simulated world is, is very low, right? If you kind of follow this idea. And I don't want to be convinced. I didn't like it. But Neil said he did not like that idea. And he actually spent a lot of time trying to come up with an explanation of why that was not the case. And he did. Basically, the idea is this, that what all these universes, these simulated universes have in common is they're advanced enough to have a simulated universe kind of underneath them. In other words, somewhere in some lab, they have a computer running a simulation of the entire universe that's within that universe. We right now, currently, as far as we know, we do not, which means either we are living at the very last sort of universe in this chain, the one that hasn't yet developed its own sub reality, sub universe. So either that, and we have, you know, multiple universes above us, or maybe just one, the original base layer, base reality, or we are base reality. We are the soul universe. So if you think of it that way, the chances of us living in a simulated reality goes from one in, you know, bazillion, some large amount, like a very low chance to, I mean, it's 50-50, right? Either we're at the bottom of this long chain or we're in base reality, 50-50. Those are much better odds. 
either we, we are, are the, the real one right or we're the one in the chain that's still evolving so the odds of us being a simulation goes from a gazillion to one it flips 50 50. wow and i'm good with that however now we're rapidly approaching the time when we might be able to build entire world simulators opening eyes talking about it nvidia is talking about it here's dr jim fan yeah, a researcher at NVIDIA, talking about how the ultimate sort of AI slash robot would be a foundation agent that is able to sort of generalize across realities. They can be trained in a simulation that would translate to the real world. They would be able to take any form, any shape. They would sort of seamlessly be able to navigate between simulations and reality. Or as he puts it, if you imagine this robot being able to navigate 10,000 different simulations, then you can simply think of the 10,001st simulation being our reality. For that agent, it would be just another Tuesday, just another reality that it was able to generalize across. And this is what we're seeing here with this robot training in Isaac Jim, and then that robotic wheel looking thing being able to generalize that to the real world. All the skills that it learned in simulation translate seamlessly almost into the real world. It's funny because if you go back just a few years ago, I mean, people would talk about this idea of the real world creating a simulated world. And, you know, five plus years ago, people would wonder, well, what was the purpose of creating this simulated world, right? This thing that runs the simulation, it gives us everything, it gives us lives and the universe, everything, right? But why? And people would wonder and say things like, well, maybe it's because they wanted to see how things could unfold in the past, in history. Or in Rick and Morty, that simulated universe was there basically as a car battery. The people in it basically existed to generate energy to run the guy's car. The point is, five years, we didn't really know what use a simulation was to the real world. Kind of do now. It's becoming really obvious. And that reason is data. These robotic hands running in a simulation, learning to twirl a pen, are very useful to us millions of them sitting there forever twirling pens or learning how to walk or juggling a ball or whatever is very, very useful to us because it provides data that we can extract and use it in the real world. If our guesses are correct about how Sora used the Unreal Engine to maybe generate some of this data that was used for training that model, then that would be an example of a sort of simulation, a 3D simulation being used to generate data for some higher function, in this case, this AI model. This is kind of an important thing to understand because in the last maybe five years or so, our perception of, you know, running a simulation went from, you know, oh, you know, that's cool. That's science. It might be useful. Hmm. How interesting. To now it's, it's money, money. It's the new gold because it produces data. Data is the new oil and various simulations are the oil wells. Unreal Engine produces data for a video engine. This robot in a simulation picking up boxes and putting to your cart translates into a real robot capable of doing that. Think about how much, for example, Amazon could benefit from having something like this that is able to, I mean, it's probably not going to have wheels on its hands, but you know, you get the idea. Robots could be extremely useful. These sorts of dexterous, mobile robots capable of navigating any terrain, picking up boxes, they, they could be useful for a lot of different applications. And this firm is awaiting imminent patent approval on the next generation of robots that have both huge military and civilian applications. Now, right now, dear listener, this stock trades over the counter at 10 cents a share, but you can... Yeah, sorry, I made that last part up, but the point remains. NVIDIA is doing a lot more pushing forward simulations. Who uses them? Researchers, engineers, analysts. They're used to predict the weather patterns, simulate various spreads of diseases, accelerate financial models speed up engineering simulations, self-driving cars, etc. They have a video somewhere where they simulate an entire BMW factory, including the production line, workers. And like you see there are clips where a worker approaches some piece of machinery and like, you know, it shows him getting hurt, not like graphically, but it clips him and it flashes red, meaning, hey, this is a dangerous situation. So this 3D simulation of a plant of a car production plant, I believe it was BMW that was uh, requesting that, gets fully simulated with people running around it. And then when all the bugs are ironed out, you know, that data is taken out and then an actual real world plant 
is then build with those specifications. Generative agents was a type of simulation. It was in 3D, it was pretty simple, but basically each character was its own GPT, chat GPT, running around, making friends, making decisions. And their behavior was extremely lifelike, extremely believable, more so than the human players that were playing the game. But my point here is that we're probably going to be seeing more and more advanced simulations with more and more intricate details. I mean, some of these robotic sims, they're simulating current flowing through the various appendages, maybe even having different frictions on different arms of the robot, different current flow through the arms. So basically simulating the various inconsistencies and potential differences that could happen in the real world, different levels of friction, different wind, etc. So we, when we take it out, that's at least what this deep mind robots playing soccer, that's kind of what they were talking about is they're able to create these robots that, first of all, they, none of this was taught. So how they play was 100% learned in a simulation. So kind of kind of looks like this. They figure out how to do various things. And because of those different shifts in how various forces, functions, etc., they're more robust when they come out of the simulation. They're more robust to the little things that can go wrong. They're better able to handle adversity, if you will. So I don't think it's a stretch to say that eventually we'll be simulating entire parts of reality, potentially even at some point something that approaches the entire reality. And in terms of whether or not we live in the base reality or in one of the simulations, I mean, that's just a thought experiment. I would not take this thing too seriously. Although I got to say this double slit experiment, it's so weird because it sure seems like parts of our reality don't get rendered until we're looking at it, until we're measuring it in some way. And there's a new research published in April 2023 that has demonstrated that the double slit experiment also holds true regarding time and not just space. But it's probably nothing. In other news, Grok with a Q, an AI hardware startup, creates an insanely fast and inexpensive AI chip to run inference. So they have these LPU architecture language processing unit, a new class of processor for a new class of workloads. And you can test it at grok.com, G-R-O-Q.com, and it's fast. It is very, very fast. Here's a prompt, create a short story about a traveling AGI salesman. And there it goes. So that was 3.2 seconds. And here it's running Mixtrel, the open source model. We might have to do a full deep dive on Grok, but at this point, it seems like there's another very interesting, very powerful competitor in the AI chip space. It probably is going to have its own sort of niche that it's going to be good at. Here's a quick interview with one of the founders. Whenever a discussion about artificial intelligence takes place, the rooms here, the huge halls get hacked. The world's first language processing unit that can run programs like Meta's Llama 2 model, for example, faster than anything else in the world. 10 to 100 times faster. <laughs> uh, it's Grok, and we spell it with a Q. Right. And it's because it comes from a science fiction novel, and it means to understand something deeply and with empathy. Of course it does. We've had all the greatest minds in here. What's your story? Most chips they they don't have enough memory inside of them, mm. then you need to set up part of the assembly line, tear it down over and over again. Right. And that's slow and it takes a lot of time. And that's what happens with the GPU. You have to read from that memory. So thousands of times for every word that comes out, mm. it's as if you're setting up the assembly line over and over. Hey, I'm Grot. You can talk to me like I'm a person. All right, I will do. Today? What makes you different from the large language model that I may have used in the past? Sure, I'm a bit different from those big language models you've used before. I'm a language user interface, or Louis, designed to have more natural... Got it! How similar are you to a I'm human brain? Well, I'm not a human brain, but I'm designed to understand and respond to you like one. What I want to know is, if they're in the middle of Dubai, how is she this blitzed? In other news, remember Q Star? Apparently, former GitHub CEO Nat Friedman and his investment partner Daniel Gross shelled out 100 million to Magic, the developer of an artificial intelligence coding assistant. What did they see? Well, they're claiming to be able to process 3.5 million words of text input. And Magic also privately claimed to have made a technical breakthrough that could enable active reasoning capabilities similar to the QSTAR model developed by OpenAI last year. Magic's co-founder and CEO, Eric Steinberger, has grappled with the problem of getting AI models to reason before. He previously worked at Meta Platforms, 
conducting research on how reinforcement learning can help AI models find optimal solutions. So not too much details here. So maybe there's not too much there to dig in. Maybe it's hype marketing. We'll see. But it sounds like the investors not only are giving them a hundred million, but also providing with their sort of private cluster of GPU units of NVIDIA chips. So sounds like they're seeing something. So let's keep an eye on magic and see what they're cooking up. Next in AI news, we have a bit of a plot twist. Stanford Medicine study identifies distinct brain organization patterns in women and men. Stanford Medicine researchers have developed a powerful new artificial intelligence model that can distinguish between male and female brains. The extent to which a person's sex affects how the brain is organized and operates has long been a point of dispute among scientists. While we know the sex chromosomes we are born with help determine the cocktail of hormones our brains are exposed to, particularly during early development, puberty, and aging, researchers have long struggled to connect sex to concrete differences in the human brain. Brain structures tend to look much the same in men and women, and previous research examining how brain regions work together has also largely failed to turn up consistent brain indicators of sex. In their current study, so this is Vinod Menon, and his team took advantage of recent advances in artificial intelligence, as well as multiple large data sets to pursue a more powerful analysis than has previously been employed. First, they create a deep neural network model, which learns to classify brain imaging data. As researchers showed brain scans to the model and told it that it was looking at a male or female brain, the model started to notice what subtle patterns could help it tell the difference. This model demonstrated superior performance compared with those in previous studies, in part because it used a deep neural network that analyzes dynamic MRI scans. When the researchers tested the model on around 1,500 brain scans, it could almost always tell if the scan came from a woman or a man. The fact that it works so well in many different data sets, including brain scans from multiple sites in the US and Europe, make the findings especially convincing as it controls for many confounds that can plague studies of this kind. This is a very strong piece of evidence that sex is a robust determinant of human brain organization, Menon said. The team then wondered if they could create another model that could predict how well participants would do on certain cognitive tasks based on functional brain features that differ between women and men. Does this man have no fear? They developed sex-specific models of cognitive abilities. One model effectively predicted cognitive performance in men, but not women and another in women but not men. The findings indicate that functional brain characteristics varying between the sexes have significant behavioral implications. So I'm very curious to know how this is received because, I mean, here in the States at least, we have a bit of a contentious discussion about some of these things. How does a study like this play into it? In other news, Google releases Gemma, their new state-of-the-art open models. So Gemma is a family of lightweight, state-of-the-art, open models built from the same technology that's used to create the Gemini models. So they're releasing the model weights as well as some tools to support developers. Looks like here it shows its comparison to Llama 2, doing seemingly better on most of the tasks, at least where it's compared. So here I'm happy they're, they stopped saying AI safety when they're meaning, you know, censoring certain outputs that shouldn't be AI safety, right? That's... So, they're, so it seems like they're using responsible now here, which is good. So my concern would be, did they over-tighten the censorship screws or not? Um, that might make it very difficult to use. If not, then, then it could be a very good tool. Either way, having more open source models is phenomenal for the whole industry as a whole. More people developing stuff, sharing information, and the open source community, the power of the open source community grows. So that's it for me today. I hope you enjoyed that. My name is Wes Roth, and thank you for watching.